All right, boom. Dr. Anthony Chafee. Hey. Sorry to make you sit through them ads. <laughs> That's all right. <laughs> He's got bigger ass ads. <laughs> You've walked in. I was like... We put up some new stuff and I thought, surely no one's head can hit this camera mount and you've come yeah. close. Yeah. You're a fucking beast. How yeah. tall are you? Oh, just 6'3", not all that big. Yeah. But thick and fit. <laughs> I don't know what else. Right, you yeah. hear like neuroscience or... Oh, right, we should introduce you properly. <laughs> yeah. You're a, um, a proponent for the carnivore diet and you mm-hmm. an ex-professional rugby player, mm-hmm. given size. Mm-hmm. And uh, you're a neuroscientist, is that correct? Uh, yeah, well, yeah, neurosurgical registrar. So I, you know, I work here in Perth uh, in my in in a capacity for as the neurosurgical um, registrar. Yeah. What's your favorite hat to wear out of all the stuff I just mentioned? <laughs> well, yeah, well, I mean, I like them all. You know, I, I've always been very fascinated with medicine and and human health and and trying to help people get better. And and so it was actually very difficult for me to pick a specialty. And because I just liked everything, but, uh, you know, I, I absolutely love neurosurgery. I love operating and being there, uh, when people really need you and someone has a, has an accident and they have a bleed on their brain and they're going to die in front of you and you're able to go there and take them in, uh, to the operating room and save their life. I think that's just a, just an incredible thing that you can do for someone. So I really love that. But, you know, the more I've done, I've delved into the whole you know, carnivore space and, and seen just such how, how much of an impact that makes on people's life and health. I think that's been extremely rewarding and important as well. So I, I'm really torn. I just like, I love them both really. When did you start getting into your carnivore nutrition? Like, do you talk mm-hmm. about your frame was slight? Do you, did you always from a young age, where had you discover that was the diet for you? So I, that was, that was like 23 years ago now. So I was like, I was like 20 years old and, um, so not too long after. The rugby, you kind of. So yeah, so so basically, a couple of years after that incident with that, with that monster, <laughs> and I always always ate a lot of meat. And I always just loved meat, and uh, we always had cold foods. And my mom always cooked. You know, we never really ate out or anything like that. So we were always having. There was always meat. There was like vegetables and you know some some rice or something like that, some sort of carb. But always whole foods, meat predominant. And I ate the other stuff out of sufferance. Like I only wanted to eat the meat, um, and so. When I was taking cancer biology at the University of Washington in Seattle, we and I'd already taken biology and botany and 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 all these other sort of classes. We learned in cancer biology that there are actually chemicals and and naturally occurring toxins in plants that they use to defend themselves. There's you know, and plants are under constant assault by animals and insects, and they they account for about ninety nine percent of life on Earth. So they have to have defenses. Nothing has made it through the gauntlet of evolution that had that doesn't have robust defenses. And while animals can run away or fight back, plants can't because they're stationary. So they need other defenses. And one of those main defenses is is being poisonous. And so if you eat them, they will harm you or in some way or another. And so we were learning this from a cancer perspective. So we were looking at carcinogens and we found that there were dozens, if not over a hundred known carcinogens in the produce that we eat on a daily basis. I mean, we know about edible and inedible plants, right? Like if you get lost out in the bush, you run out of food. You can't just eat any random plant. You know, most of them will make you very sick or even kill you. That's because they're inedible, right? So why are they inedible? Because they're poisonous. They have these poisons. So there's spinach and broccoli and kale are also poisonous. They will kill other animals. It's just we have more defenses and ability to detoxify the specific complement of toxins in spinach and celery and cabbage. But, you know, another animal may not. And so some of these things can cause inflammation and cause damage and and cellular distress that eventually can can lead to cancer. So it's carcinogen just increases your risk of cancer. Um, and so we learned that 22 years ago, 23 years ago now, that Brussels sprouts had 136 identified carcinogens in them and that mushrooms had over 100, spinach, kale, lettuce, celery, cabbage, cucumber, broccoli, you name it, any plant that you've ever eaten, there was there was a list of all the different carcinogens in them and like, like the number of them. There wasn't a single one under 60. And I was very surprised by that. And, you know, and you think, okay, well, maybe they have carcinogens, but do they have a lot of carcinogens? Are they really doing much to you? Well, there was there was research from uh, University of California, Berkeley professor, uh, Dr. Bruce Ames, published in 1989, identifying a, a lot of these different uh, poisons and toxins, these naturally occurring 
poisons that that plants use as a pesticide as an insecticide we spray insecticides and pesticides to stop insects and animals from eating them the plants do that themselves that's why you know we have gmos where we take this little protein here that makes it so you know this this bug can't eat wheat and you put that in corn and now that bug can't eat corn right that's how that works it's a poison that's making it more poisonous and so that's a natural thing and so he found that the naturally occurring pesticides and insecticides that plants make on their own outweighed the pesticides we spray on them commercially by a factor of 10,000, right? So there's 99.99% of the pesticides in the plant are naturally occurring in the plant. And that they looked at mushrooms, just white mushrooms, and uh, ALAR was a specific pesticide that was, was being looked at in this study. It's used on apples and other sorts of things like that. Helps them ripen, helps them, you know, keep pests off. And they found that the white mushrooms were 500 times more likely to cause cancer than the pesticide ALAR that they tested this against as well. And so this is why we still have these pesticides because they were saying, well, these pesticides are poisonous. Well, that's the whole point. <laughs> they are poisonous. They stop things from, from eating them. But the plant is worse. And so they're like, okay, well then, you know, it's a drop in the bucket. If you're going to eat the plant, then, then the pesticide we spray on it isn't as much. Now you're you're losing like glyphosate and things like that came in after that. So I have no idea how that stacks up. I'm sure it's not good, but you know, they still spray glyphosate here. Yeah, they do. Yeah. And so, and so that's the thing. It's just, but we have to, we have to consider that the plant isn't, it's not, if you grow it in your own garden, and you don't use this stuff that it's safe. It's not, It, it it's safe. It's a relative term. Is there no toxins in it? No, it's not the case. They do have a lot of these toxins in it. And uh, safe, you can survive on it. Sure, is that optimal? Is it the best thing for your body? Absolutely not. And so we were blo- very blown away by this. I remember looking around wildly, just like, how, how can this be true? There must be someone in on this. This has to be a joke. Everyone was just looking around wildly. Believable with Brussels sprouts, though. They actually, yeah. they taste poison. <laughs> yeah, they do. Pop- Popeye <laughs> lied to us. There was a Simpsons. They talk about, um, like, it was, you know, one of the, like, a Halloween special sort of things. And, like, Homer was, like, eating broccoli and he chokes and he dies. And, like, ho- and, like Dr. Hibbert's just like, He's like, oh, yes, you know, the broccoli, one of the most deadly vegetables out there. I'm like, what? Really? I thought it was good for you. Oh, no. You know, they, they're, they're totally de- deadly. And that's why they try to warn you with their horrible taste. You know? <laughs> and, you know, that's a joke, but it's dead accurate because that bad taste, that bitter taste is your tongue and your brain, which are sophisticated machines, recognizing harmful chemicals. And they are giving you a very distinct visceral warning saying, do not eat this. This is bad for you. And, you know... So this is why kids, you know, who are closer to their genetic origins and, and biology, they hate vegetables, right? Now they like sugar, but that sugar is an outlier. It's a drug. It's addictive. And we're just talking about things that taste bad. So things that taste bad, you can, you can pretty much trust that's going to be bad for you. And so these kids are just like, nope, that's bad for me. You know, deer don't go around eating the shitty tasting leaves. They don't have a health coach going around like, I know those ones, those ones taste like shit, but they'll look great on your ass. You know, like, no, they, they just, they, they eat what tastes good. Right. And they, and they do well for that. Um, so why would we, yeah, why would we evolve to hate the taste of, of our most biologically appropriate food? It doesn't make any sense. You know, because that, Nature's natural. It happens on its own. And so if we needed this horrible tasting thing to survive, we'd all be dead, you know, because we were around a long time before, uh, you know, somebody at some university just said, oh, yeah, you know, eat your broccoli. It's, it's a superfood. You know, someone who was trying to sell you broccoli really is what it is. And so, you know, so we, we learned all that and we were very blown away. I remember looking around like no one was joking no no one was in on the joke i was i was looking at someone that hoping that someone was just gonna be smirking or laughing in the corner uh but no one was and so i remember thinking in my head i was just like but but vegetables are still good for you though right even though we just learned that they weren't and he just looked at us and he was just like he just gave us this funny look and he just said yeah i don't eat salad i don't eat vegetables i don't let my kids eat vegetables plants are trying to kill you <laughs> So I was like, right, you know, forget plants. And I just, I went uh, immediately after that class, I went to the grocery store and I was just walking around. I was just like, what the hell do I eat then? <laughs> you know, because like everything had plants in it. You know, it was bread, pasta, produce, every mixed sort of bag, anything, everything had plants mixed in. Anything that someone else made had plants, sugar, sugars from a plant um, mixed in with it. 
And so I came across some eggs and I was like, okay, eggs, eggs don't have, don't come from plants and meat, meat doesn't come from plants. So I just, I just got a bunch of ground beef and eggs and I just started eating meat and eggs and that was it. And, you know, for the first couple of weeks, I was just looking around at all the things that like I couldn't eat and I was like, oh my God, you know, what is it? You know, I, I can't have that. I can't have that. All this stuff is plants. And after two weeks, I just didn't care. All I wanted was meat and eggs. I was just looking forward to it every day. I was just like, oh, I can't wait to get some, some beef and eggs. I was like, that sounds good. And I just felt amazing after that. My, my athletic performance just went through, it just went to another level. And I just started, you know, my, I just started getting so much more fit and my athletic performance and fitness just started taking off an exponential level. Like I was by far just leaps and bounds more fit than anyone else on my team. Like I, I got so much more out of what I was doing. I could push myself way harder. I recovered much faster. I had a rule in my head that was just like everything I did was at a dead sprint. Every single, single drill, every even the warm up lap, I was going to be first. No one was going to beat me on anything. And like for the first couple of weeks, you know, I did that most of the time. And then sort of, you know, someone else was dragging and sort of saved me for the last few. We couldn't beat them. After two weeks, no one could beat me on anything at any time ever for the rest of the next few seasons. You hadn't changed anything. You didn't change, nothing changed other than your diet at that time. You stopped, I stopped, I stopped uh, eating plants. I stopped drinking, which is also from a plant, you know? So that was a major one too, you know? Yeah. And even though I would only drink like, you know, after a game, you know, I wouldn't necessarily drink during the week. Uh, that made a massive difference, you know, the, your recovery and, uh, you know, like instead of just dragging for the next like three days uh, after a game, I was, I was better on Sunday. I could go and train. I can go and lift. I can go and run. So I, I was I was recovering much better. I wasn't getting sore as much. I was able to do uh, more work than other people, and I was I was playing at the university level. I was also playing at the men's uh, you know senior level, and and I was just training on my own, going to the gym. I was just like I just go 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 go, and and that was a direct result of the food that I was eating. I could not do that before. And did you, did you find sorry? Did you find like in those early days of the information and you your mind being blown by your professor? Did you were you writing notes like how you were feeling? Because at that stage, obviously, it was like self discovery in a way. Mm. So were you like keeping notes on shit day four? Yeah, physical fitness felt amazing. Strength feels amazing. Or and to see you could reflect back on and go shit. This is there's a pattern. Here. Yeah, knee split someone's forehead. Ten percent. Yeah. Ten yeah. percent stronger kneecap. Yeah, exactly. Because <laughs> was it just you doing it, or were the other guys in the class? No, it was just me. Yeah. So well, did so you do that? Did you take notes or anything? So, no, I did. I didn't. Unfortunately, um, I didn't. I didn't really think about that. All I just was like, right, plants are trying to kill me. Just not going to eat those things. I didn't like them anyway. It's very easy. <laughs> yeah. yeah exactly. so, I want to know though. So I understand like. Almonds have arsenic in them, or something like that. Cyanide, yeah. Is it cyanide? Yeah. Um, is there chloroform in spinach? Have I just well, made that? Have well, I make that up? Chloroform. <laughs> well, it's chlorophyll. Cool. Yeah, that's yeah, what yeah, I meant. Yeah. Well, like <laughs> <Borophyll>. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but uh, like, obviously, there's these measurable poisons. But mm -hmm. I'm sure, like vegetarians, obviously they eat, they only eat vegetarians. They don't walk over and die from poison. Like, yeah. how much? of this do you need or are you saying that even this the slightest micro amount of it you can do without kind of thing well that's the thing you know i mean you know as people will say dose makes the poison and obviously more of a bad thing is going to be a worse thing um you know even even like micro doses of arsenic in some studies have shown to be you know have some sort of hormetic benefit and you know so maybe in very small doses in certain amounts maybe but you don't know what those doses are. You don't know how much you need to have. You don't know how much is in each leaf. Uh, people aren't just eating one leaf. Uh, there are thousands of, of these uh, chemicals in each plant. You do which ones are hormetic, which ones aren't hormetic. Are they all hormetic at the same level? This one's hormetic, and now all these are hormetic at the exact? Unlikely. You know, the plant is making these things to stop animals from eating it. It's not making it to, I mean, these, these, these chemicals were, were made hundreds of millions of years ago. You know, to stop insects, you know, caffeine was developed as a neurotoxin insecticide hundreds of millions of years before humans existed, or at least millions of years before humans existed. Uh, that was not uh, in the hopes that one day some little shaved monkey is going to, you know, have a, have a bright, wonderful morning because they get to drink me, you know, no, it's not, it's not what they're doing this for. And so, you know, maybe you know, maybe in, in, you know, I'm sure in small enough doses, you know, it's not really going to cause much of a problem. We do have a capacity to detoxify these things. Absolutely. Uh, does that mean that you're going to get 
benefits from eating this apart from survival. You know, if you are lost in the woods and you're dying, then yes, you know, having some edible plants, that is that is a benefit. And that I, that was something that I would do if I had to. I would eat some fruit. I'd eat some other things if I, if I recognize them as safe. But that doesn't mean that that's optimal. That doesn't mean that that's the best thing that we can have. Now, let's say, you know, I, I would call like, you know, fatty red meat, like one of the best things you can have, right? Especially like, you know, wild grass finished sort of buffalo, something like that. Then you got lean chicken breast, you know, it doesn't have all the fats, doesn't have all the things. It doesn't taste all that good, right? That's because your body wants other other uh, nutrients, right? And it doesn't have that. You know, the chicken thighs taste much better because it has more of the nutrients. And so the difference between those is significant. Like this, the, the chicken breast is not as good as the beef. It's still good for you. It's still objectively better than nothing, but it's not as good. So it's not optimal, right? And so there's already a disparity there. With plants, most of them are going to give you some nutrients. They're going to let you survive, but they're also it's going to come to price. And so it's going to detract a bit from your health as well. And so I think that that disparity is, is much bigger. So why would you if you yeah. don't have to? Um, as far as you know, how bad are these poisons? I mean, you know, going back to the edible and inedible plants, you know, we know that these inedible plants will kill you. And I talked to vegans and vegetarians. Oh, oh no, but plants are good. Plants are this. I'm like we're not in the garden of Eden. We can't just eat any random plant. Right. And so, you know, and I ask them, like, can you just eat any random plant when you get lost in the woods? And they're like, well, no, of course not. Well, why not? Well, well, because you get sick. Okay. Why would you get sick? And you finally bring them around. It's like, well, because they're poisonous. And it's like, yeah. So your yeah. Th- sort of theory is you don't know what's in this spinach or uh, where it's come from, what pesticides and all that. So you, you just feel it's safer just to, to if you don't need it <coughs> well, on like a, macro level mm-hmm. why risk having it yeah well i mean look i mean spinach isn't, isn't going to kill you but you know people talk about it's like oh well you know doing a pretty bad job you know like my professor said plants are trying to kill you so that's a phrase that i've used you know a few times and just just relaying that story and oh they're doing a bad job of killing you it's like well actually actually they're not you know because i mean look at the prevalence and of of chronic diseases look at diabetes look at heart disease look at cancer look at um you know autoimmune diseases look at dementia look at autism all of these things have tripled or more in the last 40 years since we've gone more plant-based and processed plant-based because that's the thing you know like we have a plant-based diet right now in australia and in america and the western world it's just you know processed carbs and sugar those come from plants don't kid yourself that's a plant-based diet 70 percent of our calories come from plants or more mm-hmm. right and they, they are oh well you should you should go to you know a vegan vegetarian diet okay well then oreo cookies and heroin those are vegetarian and vegan right so you go on the Oreo cookie and heroin diet, right? And I mean, there that's are people. Fun. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, you know, if I was going to do it, you know, <laughs> yeah, yeah. and that's probably one I go for. But you know, but that's the thing, you know. So, so you, you any plants, any plants are okay. You know, all these studies show that eating more fruits and vegetables are better for you. Well, first of all, most fruits will kill you too, you know, because they want they want something to eat them, not necessarily you. Most of them have, have evolved with birds. You know, think about the cassowary bird. It's, it's an, uh, native here to Australia. They uh, they just eat fruit and there's about 150 different tropical fruits that they eat every single one will kill you right because the seed germinates only in the gut of a cassowary bird and so that plant will not grow the next generation unless it goes through a cassowary bird and so if a cassowary bird fucking wild leaves nature. that ass, yeah, it is <laughs> such a weird there's, way for that fruit yeah. to survive from a yeah. fucking animal <laughs> yeah it is and and that's the thing there's a lot of this co-evolution that's happened especially with plants especially with plants and animals what i learned in seventh grade biology was that plants and animals are in an evolutionary arms race plants becoming more and more poisonous so less and less animals can eat them so they can survive and thrive Animals becoming more and more adapted to specific poisons in specific plants so they can eat that plant and survive and thrive and they don't have to compete for resources. Wallabies eat plants that will kill basically anything else, right? Koalas eat eucalyptus. Nothing else eats eucalyptus, right? But they don't eat anything else either, right? Because they don't have the mechanisms to break down the toxins in other things apart from eucalyptus. And so, so that's the thing. You know, a lot of the plants that we eat aren't just like spinach where, you know, it's, it's, um, you, you can just sort of eat it raw and I don't know why you would, but you know, you could, My and, son does. and, yeah, and you could, yeah, well, mostly because people get told that it's well, good it's, for them. It's literally the only vegetable he eats. And obviously 
we grew up like our parents did thinking you've got to eat your fruits and vegetables because yeah. they're good for you. So it's that kind of mindset. But to just to let you know, my wife, um, she has quite, uh, she's quite intolerant to a lot mm. of food. So we actually did carnivore oh. in 2019. Great. Um, we both did it together. I did it for about a month and honestly, like it felt amazing. I mm. think we would have talked about it on the podcast a bunch, but the only thing that I struggled with was because i do jujitsu and around three four weeks in i'd when i'd roll i'd be sweating so much and i couldn't every time i'd go to stand up i'd be really lightheaded hmm. and i think because I've, I've studied it a bit I'm, I'm guessing i wasn't consuming enough fats but mm-hmm. i was going to ask is that something that you see in other people that try this diet and then do high intensity physical exercise yeah. To, is that common or? Yeah, well, I, I was actually just going to say you might not have been eating enough fat. That's 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 the common thing I do see because you know we're, we're eating a lot of meat. Okay, well I'm just going to eat meat. I'm going to l- remove all that, but we still have it in our heads that fat's bad for you. It is not. Yeah, animal fats are good for you. That is what the animal kingdom runs on is saturated fat. Carnivores and herbivores get the majority of their calories from saturated fat. Carnivores because they eat animals with saturated fat and they go for the fat first. Also herbivores, because that's actually what they break down fiber into. They don't actually break down fiber. No vertebrate animal can break down fiber. The bacteria in their gut is what eats the fiber. And as a byproduct, they make short chain fatty acids, which are 100% saturated. And that's what the cow or the gorilla or the chimpanzee or, or whatever, that's what they absorb. And then the bacteria die off and they absorb that as protein. So a cow may be eating grass, but what it's absorbing is fat and protein. Yeah, And so we're told fat's bad for you. It is absolutely not. That was, that's a flat out lie. It's a verifiable lie. The Journal of the American Medical Association, JAMA, um, published in 2016 a, a paper from University of California, San Francisco Medical School, which is one of the top medical schools in America and, and research institutions. And they published actual internal memos from the sugar companies called the Sugar Association uh, back in like the 60s, detailing how there was there was information and data coming out that actually sugar was was causing heart disease, was involved for the rise of heart disease. Mm-hmm. And they're like, well, we need to put out opposition industry research. And so they detailed how they paid off three Harvard professors <laughs> to falsify data and publish fraudulent studies to make it appear as if cholesterol caused heart disease and when it was really sugar. And one of those professors was named head of the USDA in the United States Department of Agriculture. And he was the one who authored and published the USDA Declaration in 1977 condemning saturated fat and cholesterol, saying they cause heart disease. And because it came from teacher, everyone was just like, well, that's it. That's the answer. This was hotly debated for the last 40 years. Yeah. And yet now, because teacher said so, like, oh, that's it. It just shut down the argument. And after that, you know, people listened. You know, I, I talk to doctors now, like, oh, the reason people are fat sick is because they don't listen. You shouldn't, you know, about what you should eat and what you shouldn't eat. And I'm like, this is coming from an overweight doctor, by the way. And... <laughs> And I was just like, well, no, actually the problem is that they did listen. Because if you look at the consumption data in America, we reduced our red meat by over 33%, reduced fat and cholesterol by about the same, increased fruits and vegetables by 30 and 40% respectively, increased grains, over tripled the amount of seed oils we're eating, over tripled the amount of high fructose corn syrup we're eating. What were the results? Well, first of all, heart disease rates tripled, right? So you can't say that red meat and fat cause heart disease if you reduce both and heart disease triples yeah. right if anything you say is protective and in fact that's what we're seeing in the literature now in the last sort of decade we're seeing a very very different story when people are actually doing very very serious and robust studies with hundreds of thousands of patients there is not even a correlation between ldl cholesterol or saturated fat and heart disease none 